how badly provided the Russian forces. They are now firing shells. It's still quite enormous at the same rate as the Ukrainians. They are running down their artillery stocks uh, at the same rate, it seems, in key areas as the Ukrainians. And they're not getting stuff forward. The bits that you have to pick up, these terrible attacks on Odessa and so on, but the Ukrainians are still bashing away at logistics, bridges, hubs, another one's gone into, into Crimea. So just uh, update us on, on what's happened. We'll start with Odessa. Just update us on, on what's been happening with these strikes. Well, since the grain deal whereby Ukraine and Russia could get grain shipments by sea out of uh, the southern ports across uh, the Black Sea through the Bosphorus, they cancelled that about uh, the beginning of the week, just said no, no, no. And then uh, they have said any commercial ship heading for um, a Ukrainian port would be deemed to be carrying arms. This is particularly outrageous and would be a military target. We have yet to see that. I think it was to put the insurers off. And they've been attacking facilities in Odessa and the big dockyard uh, facility at Mykolaiv. Um, this is a sign of desperation. This is something that Russia has said it's what its terms are for renewing the grain deal and it wants its grain and fertilizer, very important exports, to go out, uh, particularly to the south, to uh, Africa. Uh, and grain is very important as food aid uh, there. And they want to be allowed to join the, the international SWIFT banking arrangement. Sorry, if I can just quickly unpick that. In other words, they're saying, despite what everybody has been saying, your sanctions are really hurting us in the commercial sector and the banking sector. Meanwhile, fighting goes on around the sector, which has become infamous for its bloodiness for both sides around Bakhmut. Uh, things are very undecided for both sides at the moment. We've gone past 500 days of war. There's every prospect that we could have certainly many hundred more. And Robert, tell us about what's happened with the counter-offensive um, from Ukraine, particularly following the, the Prigozhin um, uprising moment that we had. Where are things from, from a Ukrainian point of view? They're tough uh, because uh, trying to break in to the Russian defences on the main line of confrontation, which runs across the pockets, which they had declared were independent and sovereign, namely Donetsk and Luhansk, and now they're claiming Zaporizhia and Kherson with much less success. But uh, the density of the minefields, which they're adding to all the time, because they drop it with shells, with artillery, dropping mine uh, ordnance. Uh, it is the most mined territory in the world now, this part of uh, Ukraine. And heavy defences, anti-tank defences, they're finding it very hard. They need long-range fire. They haven't got the air power to do it. But at the moment, over that area, neither side is winning. The extraordinary thing is things are very, very balanced. And given, you know, the list of tanks and aircraft, which we all heard and saw and read in the papers, back the diagrams in February to, uh, last year, 2023, Russia had an overwhelming superior, uh, superiority of force and things are going wrong. Quickly, that's where we come to Mr. Prigozhin. There is a lot of swirl and whirl going on around the Kremlin at the moment. And it is very, very difficult to decipher. In journalism in the late 20th century, the two most opaque courts, if I could put it, apart from, well, there was Mao's China, but above all, it was the Kremlin and the Vatican. And it was a whole specialty in most of my journalistic career to be a Kremlinologist <laughs> or a Vaticanologist. Kremlinology is way back in again. <laughs> and look, just... We'll, we'll come to what's happening in Russia in a moment, but you mentioned there about Russia's sort of terms for, for, for you know, reopening and rejoining this deal about joining the, the, the SWIFT banking uh, situation. I presume there's no chance of that happening, or, or is there? Because, I mean, this getting these green, this green out is so important to, to so many countries in terms of sort of the, the global food crisis that we've got. 
Yeah, they're pressing the buttons. Aisha, absolutely right. They would find people who have had a lot of trade and a big trade presence uh, in Russia, particularly Italy, where I spent a lot of time focusing on, isn't there a way around it? That is becoming less and less because of Russian behavior, because the most of the civilized world is signed up to the fact that, uh, that there is uh, an indictment, an international indictment against Putin as a war criminal. And it is the indiscriminate behavior, the way that actually Putin's men have just tried to bomb Ukraine. And by that, I mean Ukrainians, not just their armies, out of existence. And that is why they are losing goodwill. You can see it in the votes and the maneuvering. They had quite a lot of support from the developed and developing world, to use a ghastly phrase, but you know, we mean the South, particularly Asia, particularly Africa. We can see visibly that that is waning now, so they won't get back in. I think we have to, before we go on, talk about what is going on in Russia, what has to be clear now is that Putin has got Russia in a far worse place than he could ever possibly have examined at the beginning of last year and when he started the adventure and launched these 120,000 troops into Ukraine on February the 24th, uh, 2022. Yeah, it's so interesting about how it's kind of panned out for, for him. Now, let's let's look at what's happening in, in Russia and talk to us about this um, blogger who has been critical of Putin, um, Igor uh, uh, Gherkin, because he, he's not a kind of, you know, liberal. He's pretty sort of pro-war. What What's going on here? He's a hardline nationalist, absolutely right. And he's really saying that if you've launched a war of patriotism, which is the phrase they always invoke because it's the great war of, great patriotic war was after the invasion in 41, 41, 45. And what uh, Gherkin, as he is known, is really saying, you're not making a very good job of it. And if you were going to do this, you should have done it properly and told us why you were doing it. And there is a small doubt from the way the propaganda is falling, which uh, we pick up a day in, day out. I do quite a lot of broadcasting to Gulf and Egyptian stations, and they always have the Moscow line. What I've learnt, looked at since the beginning of this month, July, is how much softer the Moscow line has got and how these stations, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Cairo, they're much less to tolerant of mm -hmm. the guff, frankly, the propaganda that they're getting from Moscow. Because as one said to me, a Lebanese working for one of the stations in Dubai, said, we, none of us here, Robert, really believes any of this. And that's why we'd much prefer to have people like you, your colleagues coming on. At least you bring facts, say this has happened, that has happened, that appears not to have happened, and this is what we really want to find out about it. They're fed up with the bluster and bluff, which comes from Moscow, which is the old Putin line, and used to be the old Prigozhin line, by the way. He was a great propagandist. And now they're utterly confused. There's a terrific commentator, which I would recommend. I think he's appeared in your newspaper, too, from time to time, but, uh, um, uh, from Vienna. Uh, Ivan Krastov, do follow him. He writes the New York Times, writes everywhere. He's a, he's a teacher. He's a Bulgarian, actually. And he wrote a brilliant piece about Prigozhin about 10 days ago. And he said, what this proves, Putin still has his court, but he is no longer the Tsar. He's no longer mm. the king. He's surrounded by many other would-be Putins. And Ivan suggested that Prigozhin and his pals were now very much the would-be Putins. And so, you know, it, it's interesting that you've got these, as you say, these kind of hardline nationalist people who are now, um, you know, critiquing very aggressively the um, effectiveness of, of of this war effort. Now, Gherkin, this, this chap, has been um, uh, arrested. But what do you think happens next? Because it does feel like these people are feeling they have a voice and that they, they do want to be critical of, of Putin. I don't want to do the classic Western optimism bias thing where we say, oh, is there going to be an uprising? But clearly there is intense dissatisfaction about what's going on there. What do you think happens next? Uh, Aisha, you've raised absolutely the right question. What is the opposition? What are the voices? What are the things that are going in, the motions, the currents in Russia? I am no... Uh, a Sovietologist from the old times of Stalin's time, of Rutu to, to, to Brezhnev. 
But what uh, a great friend of mine who does understand this thing and knows my proclivity for Italian conspiracies, you know, all the way through history up until the present day, he said, Robert, you see everything as a Western style conspiracy. And I think that that is the key to it. It is a very Russian story that we're witnessing at the moment. And I absolutely agree with you. The thrust of your question is we see everything, success or failure, and there is plenty to be said on both sides of the counteroffensive from Ukraine in entirely Western terms. No, the Russian story is so fascinating. They are strong where they've always been strong, which is just sheer numbers, mm. heavyweight of armaments. But the bit that we are all looking at now and trying to get behind the veil, but you get it coming up on Telegram, and this is what Gherkin is reflecting, is how badly provided the Russian forces. They are now firing shells, it's still quite enormous, at the same rate as the Ukrainians. They are running down their artillery stocks uh, at the same rate, it seems, in key areas as the Ukrainians, and they're not getting stuff forward. The bits that you have to pick up, these terrible attacks on Odessa and so on, but the Ukrainians are still bashing away at logistics, bridges, hubs, another one's gone into, into Crimea. And watch the Crimean spot, watch the Black Sea, to an extent the Baltic. But the other thing that is absolutely clear, nobody, no Western supporter of Ukraine wants to talk about it. I think there are dark forces inside the Ukrainian uh, uh, regime set up, which is working at spotty insurgency inside Russia now.